the short answer portions have been graded and it added some comments on those. So you should see those updated. I've also gone ahead and updated attendance records up until today's class. So if you notice any issues or inconsistencies with attendance, let me know. Uh, I should have that down, but if there are any errors, uh, make sure to track that. And I will um, have your theory reflections again graded by the end of the week. So thank you for getting those in and doing that work. Okay. So um, just as a quick recap, we had Riley who started out our presentations. I really appreciated Riley's work here and setting a really high bar for the class in terms of uh, having these presentations sort of add to our understanding of the various theories that we'll be going over, right? As we've talked about, communication theory is widely used. Communication theory um, gets applied in a lot of other places, not all of it's communication, but um, the idea here is that we better understand how these theories are being used in the world and continue to be developed, explained, detected, and understood. So I appreciated that article as getting us started and thinking about um, some of the ways the theory plays out. We also talked about the first application paper, right? So this is week four, um, and that paper is due by the end of week number six, right? So this is the paper that's asking you to pick. Um, one of the theories from the first half of the term, apply it to an artifact or piece of communication. You'll do two application papers, and then your final assignment of the course is to do a revision, an expanded version of one of the two. Um, so we took some time last class to talk about spiral of silence theory, right? These theories have been closely engaged with media so far. Today's theory is another one uh, closely connected to media. Uh, spiral of silence theory, right, is engaged with how people are expressing viewpoints. In particular, it makes the argument that people are less willing to share a viewpoint that goes outside of a majority's opinion or what they perceive to be a majority's opinion on a topic. For instance, what appears to be a majority opinion produced through public opinion, through media, and so forth. And um, in so doing, right, it creates this fear of social isolation, of being an outcast, and therefore uh, potentially conforming with majority view on a topic. So um, there are a lot of critiques. There's elements of culture that play into this as well. For example, uh, being a contrarian or offering a hot take can be something that is seen as uh, popular or even garnering attention in somewhere like the United States. We've talked about the idea as well that um, sometimes a view that's outside of the majority viewpoint is not necessarily um, a particularly good view, right? If um, a view is very um, potentially violent or discriminatory toward a population, right, such as Nazism, that's probably not um, a good viewpoint to entertain in the same degree um, that we would with majority view. So there's a lot of critique, discussion, and areas that we can explore, right? One of the ideas here that was discussed is known as ubiquity. This deals with the idea that media is pervasive, it's everywhere, uh, probably the first thing that happens is your alarm goes off. Sometimes it goes off multiple times, right? You're checking your phone. Uh, perhaps you're somebody where you wake up and you've got a whole bunch of emails and push notifications, right? Um, you are plugged in, you're engaged, um, you're messaging people throughout the day. Um, you're using a variety of forms of media. Maybe you get home and you stream something and watch something on YouTube. Uh, so there's a whole lot that goes into our engagement with media and the way in which our lives can be impacted by our engagement with media as well. So just as a quick reminder about some of the things we're looking for in this first application paper. Um, so one note I wanted to give and in helping you to prepare for your first application paper. Uh, before a big writing assignment, one thing that I like to offer in uh, courses is the day like before or um, the last day of class before an assignment like that is due. Um, I like to make an attendance optional work day. I know a lot of people are really kind of putting their pedal to the metal to get things done and finished. So uh, week number six, so May 14th, um, that Friday is going to be an attendance optional work day. So you're welcome to come in. I'll be here. I'll be able to answer questions for you. Or if you're looking for an accountability buddy um, or just space to work, you're welcome to come in. You don't have to, though. Um, you're welcome to uh, work on your own, or if you're traveling, um, you're, you can take advantage of that. Um, but it's designed to help you in preparing for completing that assignment. And again, as a reminder here, um, your application paper is really about uh, picking a theory that interests you, explaining 
what that artifact is doing utilizing that theory. Again, looking at something like an episode of a show, um, focusing on a whole show that can be really broad, right? If you're talking about the entirety of The Office, well, you're talking about well over 100 episodes. It's very difficult to narrow things down, so I recommend focusing on an episode. Um, you might focus on real-life example, song, ad, or other piece of publicly available communication. Um, I encourage you to reach out to me if you're needing help with brainstorming and starting to think about what you might choose to analyze for the piece. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we could look at here, right? For instance, um, we could use the idea um, of uncertainty reduction theory to examine the film Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uncertainty reduction theory deals with our comfort and engagement with people over time and through the process, right, of the main character and her daughter, I'm not going to spoil, um, we come to understand how these two relate and engage with one another um, in a better capacity. So, you know, think about a theory, think about a piece of communication you're interested in, and that'll help. So for today, um, we'll have in just a little bit, uh, Cole, who will be giving a presentation related to uses and gratification theory. Um, so uses and gratification theory is another theory related to media, related to our understanding and usage of media. But like I've mentioned before, a lot of our theories in this class are not necessarily going to agree with each other. In fact, uses and gratification comes in with a very different set of assumptions um, in many ways, in opposition to other theories that we've talked about, particularly agenda setting theory, right? So where you fall and how you feel um, about media and about the assumptions these theories are bringing to the table are important, right? This class, not every theory um, is going to line up and make sense with other theories we've talked about. So understanding some of the history of opposition, debate, and discussion informing these theories, I think is useful. So uh, to get started, um, I'm going to ask you for your attendance today. Um, you'll be doing various chunks of this, and then you can email or turn this in to me at the end um, once you've finished all of these parts. Um, but what I would like you to do is to just take some time to think about media that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That could be examples such as various apps or programs that you incorporate. Um, might be the use of television or film, and it might also be the kinds of devices that you use. And I encourage you to think about as many examples as you can and to be as specific as you can. For instance, um, you know, what apps do you touch and get onto day to day? Um, you know, what websites do you typically visit day to day? I mean, don't tell me all of them, but tell me the ones appropriate for the class. Um, so, you know, tell me the things that you're interested in and use media for. Um, to help inform uh, our discussion in just a little bit.
take about two more minutes to continue to brainstorm your thoughts here. Go ahead and finish your current word or thought. Okay. So in getting us thinking about and starting to explore um, the uses and gratification theory. I hope that this activity is useful just to think about the sheer amount of media we engage in day to day, right? A lot of us do that without even thinking about it, um, you know, whether it's checking apps, um, checking updates, using email, using a home computer or device, uh, using the library, right? We find ourselves in many ways very plugged And what I think is really important for us to emphasize here is our agency in that process, right? It's not only that there's all of this media available to us, but it's in our decisions and choices about media that we're using and a reason for using said media, right? For example, um, one way of contrasting this is our use of social media. Um, how many folks regularly use Instagram? Okay. How about Facebook? TikTok? Right? So, few examples here of a lot of variation. For instance, um, fewer folks use Facebook over the years. Facebook's popularity has declined. It's been used a lot more by kind of older folks, right? Like uh, more um, into millennial, Gen X, Gen Z. Um, folks are less likely to use that. Um, get a lot of uh, boomers posting minion gifts on Facebook these days. Um, TikTok, right, has gained a lot of popularity and traction, but also, you know, kind of criticism and concern about its ownership. We've had uh, this kind of discussion at a national level over the last few weeks. Instagram has gained a lot of attention and popularity, too, but I highlight this to show some people might use a lot of forms of social media. Some people don't bother or are not interested, but we're making choices about media that we're using and our reasons for using said media, which brings us to UNG, right? So UNG, uses and gratification theory. Um, is making the central argument that people are active, right? They're making choices about media in order to fulfill specific needs in their lives. In other words, um, it's taking what's known as a limited effects position. Um, one area of major study in communication and media is the idea of media effects. In other words, how much impact does media itself have on us as people? Agenda setting theory, as we've discussed, takes on a role that um, media plays a large part in people's lives. It sets the agenda. Uh, but in contrast, UNG says, well, actually, we're the ones who are setting the agenda and um, are essentially picking media that appeals to our own interests um, and fits with what we want to do. In other words, um, people are self-aware, right? We're choosing media that fulfills and meets the needs that we have as people. Um, in other words, what do people do with media? How are people utilizing media and doing so in an effective way. 
Um, and therefore, how is media responding in order to meet the needs and concerns that we as people have? So this is uh, in terms of traditions and contexts, socio-cultural, mass media, and positivistic and empirical. By the way, uh, just on those quizzes as we're working through, right, when you're asked to identify the traditions and contexts, that's referring to uh, traditions such as rhetorical, cultural, uh, context, such as interpersonal, intrapersonal. So when it's asking for those, it's asking for essentially what um, kind of methods is this coming from and what populations or groups is this theory targeting? Um, so one example of this is to look at examples of uh, streaming and changes to streaming versus live action film. For instance, um, as we know, right, when COVID hit, uh, live movies in theaters also took a very big hit. A lot of people did not want to go see a movie in a theater out of concern about COVID-19, right? Um, currently, we've seen a shift toward a lot more movies that are being offered uh, live and people have the chance to go see them in the theaters, right? Super Mario Bros. movie is like um, getting close to about a billion dollars. And then you've got Guardians of the Galaxy movie comes out and so that'll be as well too. So we've seen a lot of shift of people back into theaters. Right. But one shift that happened, particularly when COVID hit, were films such as Wonder Woman 84 that were simultaneously shown in theaters and also streamed. And there's been a lot of discussion, concern, controversy surrounding this practice. But um, the use of UNG is a good way to explain why this occurred, how this is happening, and how current trends and pace and things, including streaming, uh, have shifted in response to some of these issues. So um, UNG comes from Katz, Loomer, and Gervich, who are all communication scholars uh, interested in media uh, and understanding the role that media plays in our lives. So um, to provide a little bit of context here, right, and to kind of uh, speak to some of the contrasting perspectives that UNG is engaging with. On the one end, we have what's known as a mass society theory. Right. This mass society theory is suggesting media has this large control over people's lives. Um, it has this big influence. Right. Uh, one way of thinking about this as an example, right, is it's almost like it's pouring knowledge into your head. Like, um, you know, you take a class and uh, knowledge is being poured into you, which is generally not an effective way to teach, but uh, is an example of mass society theory. We're being trained, we're being taught, we're being primed. Uh, to behave or think about a, a things in a certain way because of the role that media has, right? Limited effects is the other extreme, right? Media has less power and influence. Uh, rather, it's us who have power and who have decision making, right? Um, individual differences and our social categories and groups are explaining the choices of media that we might utilize and incorporate into our daily lives. Um, one really good example of this, and thinking about this, is thinking about the streaming wars, right? Uh, Netflix, in particular, has lost a lot of subscribers and lost a lot of revenue over the last several months, uh, just because people aren't as interested in their content. They don't see they're producing as much quality content, and they're not interested in remaining on a subscription, especially as they've become a lot more restrictive in passwords and multiple accounts, right? Which has meant that for a lot of people who might utilize their family or parents' account, uh, they can't do that anymore, so they're leaving. Um, so there's been a lot of differences in terms of how streaming and various platforms have been approaching these topics, right? Uh, Disney Plus, their approach has been very much to promote specific brands, things like Marvel, things like Star Wars, and really try to create content specific to those brands. So a lot of their popularity is coming from people who are interested in those specific brands or franchises. So UNG is saying our choices, what are we subscribed to, what are we watching, what are we paying attention to, um, is informed by our own uh, personal needs and desires. So UNG um, makes a variety of different assumptions here, right? Um, one of them is uh, the idea that the audience is active. And uh, media use is goal oriented, right? So if you've taken a class like interpersonal with me, I'm a big fan of talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We communicate and engage with one another to fulfill basic needs, whether they're things like survival, getting food and water, up to some of our more social and belonging needs. Do I feel included in a part of the group, right? If you see all of your friends are, you know, talking about this new show, um, you know, everybody is excited about The Last of Us, right? Um, so. 
when that was coming out, um, my partner and I were like absolutely trying to avoid spoilers and we would watch like the next episode of The Last of Us as soon as possible um, so that we could avoid being spoiled by it on social media, right? So um, we were interested in it, but we also were making choices about our use of media um, to fulfill goals. We were interested, we wanted to know what happens next, and media was a way of making that happen. And there's an initiative in linking our need gratification to a specific medium choice that comes from the audience member. In other words, I have a need, and I'm going to fulfill that need through the use of media. For instance, um, I just want to unwind. I want to watch something silly, right? So I'm going to watch like a silly like show, like Easy Bake Challenge on Netflix, because that's just fun, lets me turn my brain off and something in the background. Or I want to understand what's going on in the world. So I might follow a current events uh, related article, right? Um, or um, I'm really interested in music. I want to understand what new albums are coming out. So I'm going to go on YouTube and watch like the latest Anthony Fantana reviews of music, right? So I choose uh, based on my needs um, what I'm interested in exploring. Media is competing with other sources for need satisfaction. In other words, uh, we see this really clearly through the streaming wars, right? Different platforms, media are very much um, trying to gain viewers, gain support and uh, attention. Um, for example, uh, there's been a trend right in the past. Netflix is known for reviving shows that had been previously dead, uh, shows such as Arrested Development or Lucifer, right? Where they get rescued, put on Netflix. But sometimes the reverse is happening. There's actually some shows now where they started on Netflix, but another platform has saved them. For example, um, the show Uncoupled with Neil Patrick Harris was on Netflix and now it's being moved over to Showtime. So streaming wars are very evident. Um, media is trying to work hard to get our attention and interest, right? And um, you know, we've got limited money, limited subscriptions we're willing to do. A lot of people are ducking in and out of subscriptions too. This is an example of this contrast. Uh, people have self-awareness of media that they're using, their interests and motives that allow us to picture and understand as researchers how media is being used. Uh, for example, a lot of the popularity of TikTok, right, has come from the closure of a somewhat similar service buying, where there were a lot of videos, circulation of videos, um, memes, material, um, kind of audio uh, memes as well that were being circulated. And so TikTok was in many ways filling that particular gap. Um, and um, value judgments of media can only be formed by the audience. In other words, um, the audience is essentially deciding uh, whether or not something is worth it. Do I keep this subscription? Um, do I want this service? Do I have this app on my phone? Am I going to have an account here? Am I going to stop having an account here? Right? A lot of people left Facebook out of security concerns and concerns about how um, information of theirs, including private photos, is going to be used and circulated. So that paints a picture of some of the ideas about why we use uh, media in our lives. So um, there is what's known as the fraction of selection. Similar to social exchange theory, there's a mathematical formula that's being used as a part of uses and gratification theory, right? Um, and it's the idea that there is expectation of reward divided by the amount of effort required, right? For example, uh, maybe you are trying to watch a new film and it's come out on HBO Max and you're trying to get on that platform using like a family member's account. And then you realize that they've changed their account. You can't get logged in. You can't get access. You can't get the app to work, right? Um, maybe you decide that that amount of work and effort required is just not worth it and you choose something else and you just watch something really easy on Netflix. A lot of you might be familiar with just kind of like scrolling and browsing options for a really long time, whether it's YouTube videos. Um, and oftentimes we find ourselves dealing with uh, having so many choices, but nothing we want to see, right? Um, which can be an issue as well. So if there's a lot of reward, if we see the use of media as something really important and fulfilling for us, for example, we're interested in making like a Gmail account or we're interested in creating a LinkedIn profile, generally speaking, that's pretty straightforward and doesn't require a whole lot of effort to do. So we're more likely to choose to do that identically according to the theory. So UNG suggests a variety of different types of theories that we attempt to fulfill. One of them is cognitive, right? So for instance, we are 
there's been a major event or issue that's occurring. For instance, um, we want to understand what all is going on, right? Um, yesterday, Joe Biden just announced he's running for re-election. So what's going on? What was that announcement? I want to understand, so I'm going to use media to get there. Affective, we use media to fulfill something that's emotional or pleasant. For example, um, you know, we want to watch something like a feel-good movie. Um, I've got some relatives who just like love to watch corny, like Hallmark uh, style films in the holidays, right? To be fun, uh, to make you feel good. It can also be credibility and personal. Um, sometimes we use media like to create a LinkedIn profile because we know a potential employer is going to look us up online and we want that to be what shows up. We use um, communication for social needs, right? We text, we use social media, we might use something like Messenger as a way to fulfill those needs too. And we also have pension release or escapism. For example, if you're really into an audiobook, um, you're into media, um, some form uh, like a video game, right? You're really interested in kind of being lost in a different world and escaping some of the challenges that you're experiencing in your own life. So we use media as a way of filling the needs that we have prior to media. So what I'd like you to do is take a moment to return to the activity. Um, this is part number two. Um, and uh, take some time to look at the media that you wrote down as using on an average day. And take some time to classify that based on needs, right? Given these needs that we've talked about, um, in what ways is media that you're using fulfilling particular needs? And it might fulfill multiple, in which case you're welcome to write down multiple ones that it's fulfilling. I'll give you a bit of time to think about this. Give you another minute to continue classifying your media use. Go ahead and finish up.
I guess we're thinking about this, right? We're using communication to fulfill these needs, oftentimes without thinking about it, right? Like we turn on the TV, we flip open our laptop, we check our phone, right? And we do so without necessarily thinking about what this media is doing for us, but it nevertheless is helping us to fulfill those particular goals. So the needs that we have as humans, right, the needs that were highlighted earlier, right, those needs that we experience are coming out of social situations. Uh, for instance, one way of thinking about this is your student, uh, perhaps you're working a job or internship, perhaps you're involved in activities, extracurriculars, right? As a result of those social situations, we experience a lot of pressure, right? And we want to feel kind of eased from that experience. We come home from work. We want to watch something silly, right? We want to play something fun. I've been really into playing the video game Vampire Survivors, which is a very kind of mindless game where you kind of run around and um, like level up the character, right? So it's a lot of fun to be able to escape and do something that's more recreational in response to those things. We also want to be aware of problems, right? Oftentimes uh, we find ourselves interested in understanding current events or issues, right? Uh, for example, issues related to safety on campus were a concern a lot of people have brought up. They want to better understand what's going on um, so they can feel safe in that as well. Uh, real life opportunities and issues might uh, restrict their needs. You're about to go to bed and suddenly you've got an email from a coworker calling in sick and you realize you have to come in the next day, right? So sometimes uh, things happen in life that make it more difficult for us to do the things we want to do. Um, additionally, um, we might have specific values that need to be fulfilled as well. For instance, maybe you are a part of a religious or spiritual group and you see that uh, they're streaming or sharing kind of some of their work um, as it comes up out on a seasonal basis. So, um, you know, meeting those values that are important to you, you engage with that material. And we also demand our familiarity with media too. If you're like me, having like unread notifications, seeing like a, a like red number um, makes me really anxious and I want to make sure that that's resolved. So oftentimes we want to become familiar and comfortable with the media that we use. We understand how to use it effectively so that we can engage with one another well. We also are active in the choices that we're making with regard to the media that we're using, right? We're assessing uh, its utility, how useful is it, how much content does it have, um, in what way is that content engaging with us? Um, is it intentional, right? We make active choices about media that we're using. Uh, we have options to choose from, again, thinking about the streaming wars and different platforms. And the idea that we are, to some degree, impervious to influence, that while social factors can influence our needs, ultimately, we're making our own choices about, for instance, the accounts that we choose to have and the social media that we might choose to engage with. So uh, before we get into today's presentation, I uh, just want to spotlight a few critiques that have been made of this theory. First of all, uh, one of them is just this is a very broad theory, right? Talking about the idea of uh, choices, of um, organization, and um, all of those elements that can be a whole lot uh, to cover. And especially with some of the ways that media changed uh, over the last couple of years, it can be challenging to map out how um, some of these needs are being met. Um, media is also not necessarily functional, right? Media does not necessarily have the ability to completely fulfill the needs that we as humans have. Um, this has been incredibly evident in the context of COVID-19, right? Perhaps you and your friends were not able to see or spend time with each other, um, and you got on Zoom, and then you realized it's not the same, right? Um, while you had some opportunity to connect, there were challenges related to engaging with one another in a digital and virtual space. Um, so sometimes media can be useful, but sometimes it's not quite right, and sometimes it's not filling the sheer extent of needs that we have. So this idea that we have a need, media fulfills that need, um, can't necessarily work in all instances. Um, and then I think one of the biggest critiques of uh, this theory is, remember that this theory is assuming we're making intentional choices about media in our lives, and ultimately we have a lot of power over those choices, right? But uh, one way to push back against this theory is to say, well, no, we don't necessarily have as much intentional choice in our use of media consumption as uh, this theory leads us to believe, right? Oftentimes, uh, we are kind of compelled or obligated to engage in media. For example, having a professional presence like a LinkedIn, a lot of us hate that app, 
but we use it because it ensures that people can see a professional version of ourselves if they search for us online, right? Um, so sometimes it's not necessarily about the choices that we make. Sometimes we're tagged in things or included or social media accounts are created, and we didn't really get much of a say in the matter in the process of creating and choosing that profile. So one challenge can be that, um, you know, we're not necessarily choosing media to fulfill needs. Perhaps media has a lot of power to dictate what needs or issues matter to us, right? We're not watching something because we want to watch it. We're watching something because, um, you know, it is supposedly the thing that needs to be watched or it's being heavily advertised to us. So given some of those points and critiques, um, we will have Cole who will be giving our presentation of the day. So um, you're welcome to click or use the arrows as you're working through. Uh, I have the uses and gratification theory, and then my article is the internet uses and gratifications, the structural equation model of interactive advertising. Um, so the key ideas are, um, that it is about a study with a sample size of about 385 college students from the United States and Korea that participated in a study to investigate a person's motivation to use the internet. The main goal of the study was to find the confirmatory factor analysis model by finding internet usage motivation. Some websites, including shopping sites, provide interactive feedback to its users. There are four, di there are four different motivators and internet, including social interaction, information, convenience, and entertainment. There, um, there were four different hypotheses for the study. And the first one was the motivators for using the internet will have a significant effect on the user's duration of the time at a website. The next one was the information and motivation for using the internet will have a significant positive effect on the human message or human to human interactions. The third, the third one is interactivity on website will have a significant positive effect on attitude towards the website. The last one was the attitude towards the website will have a direct positive impact on the interaction. Um, then this connects to the theory through, or the study connects to the theory because, or by looking at the relationships between websites and the duration while a person is on that website. When a person uses a website, they get the gratification of feeding their interests, showing that people spend more time on websites that suit their interests. The first assumption, the first assumption talks about or talks about the audience being active and uses media for getting a certain goal. This article connects that through connecting one's goal for media and usage time. For example, if someone has a goal of obtaining a certain piece of information they spend more time using the media and more gratification than someone who doesn't have a goal. The next assumption talks about connecting media to fulfill your own needs. And the article focuses on using websites to needs and to fit your needs and how that affects your usage on a website. The third assumption does not connect with the study because of the controlled variable that everyone uses. Everyone is using the internet. The fifth assumption connects through a person's own internet connection and how they can explore the different media. Um, through reading the article and reading about the study, I learned that the first hypothesis, the direct motivation to stay on a website, the results from this hypothesis showed that three out of four motivators had direct impact on a person's time on a certain website. The motivator that didn't have an impact on was, that didn't have an impact on the time was entertainment because of the lack of information that it had. The second hypothesis stated that, stated the information motivation for using the internet will have a significant positive effect on different interactions. This taught me that the information motivation has a positive effect on human to message interaction while the social interaction hypothesis was better for the human to human interaction. Interaction. 
The third hypothesis stated that interactivity on the website will have significant positive effect on attitude towards the website. This showed that human to human interaction gives more visitors to the website than positive and more positive outcomes to the website. The final hypothesis examined the advertisements created an attitude for the website and its viewers. So my final thoughts on the study was that different websites influence how long people stay on the website, such as the contents of the website motivating the user to stay on the site longer. And that our interests and what we need, what we need to motivate our use of social media. Okay. So that's it. Well, thank you uh, for sharing this study that kind of adds to our understanding of uh, uses and gratification theories, right? Um, so in looking at this article and looking at the insights that Cole was able to bring to our discussion, uh, I think this shows us a variety of things. Um, in particular, the role of the internet, right? Um, not only do we frequently have our bookmarks, our sites that we check frequently, um, ways that we use the internet in intentional ways, but I also like, as Cole brought up, some of the choices that we're making within that media, right? So for instance, um, this study finding that if we have the opportunity to interact with each other using media, right, we go on the internet and perhaps we go to a comment section, or we have the ability to engage real time, something like a Twitch stream, um, there's a lot more uh, interest in us sticking with that media as a result of our continued engagement. That's why things like Discord are really popular, because there's the ability to actively engage and participate, and that can influence our motivations and desires here. But again, this speaks to the kind of challenging and thorny relationship, right? Is it that um, we are making choices and media is fulfilling needs, or is media itself creating needs for us that we're fulfilling through its usage? Um, so I mentioned an example here of uh, trying to examine um, the use of simultaneous release films. This is something we saw a lot when COVID first hit, but we have seen less and less now. And I think this helps us to highlight some of the differences in terms of the needs and goals that we seek through the use of media. We think about, right, the early days of COVID, um, you know, the um, pandemic and its immediate impacts. A lot of us um, were not able or did not feel safe um, going into a crowded setting like a theater, right? Um, we were concerned about the risk and uh, issues that that posed. As a result of that, um, and a result of our human concerns, right, and our human goals, we're still interested in seeing media. Um, the decision was made um, through films such as 84 um, to have it streamed um, and available uh, on the day that it was releasing in the theater to be accessed online. A few other films, for example, Black Widow uh, did a similar approach where they would release at or around the same time digitally. And overall, we have seen a shorter window between when something gets posted uh, in a theater versus when it gets moved over to a streaming service or be able to see on something like a DVD. So what we want to think about here is, on the one end, we had human needs, we had desires um, that were being fulfilled through the ability to watch something through streaming, right? We were able to avert our safety concerns and still able to watch something that we wanted to see. But um, one of the concerns that came out later, right, and was brought up over time were including a lot of directors and even people who specifically enjoy the experience of going into a theater, of having a larger screen, of having more of a collaborative and group setting um, where you could go with your friends. So there was an understanding that, you know, you watch a movie immediately on streaming and you might have a much smaller screen and it's not quite the same experience, right? So as humans, we felt a greater motivation or desire to return back to watching a movie in a theater. Again, that's why uh, some of the more recent movies, the Super Mario Bros. movie, have done so well in theaters because a lot of the ways that we are motivated and want to go see a movie live in a theater and have that experience, you know, parents bringing their kids to go see the movie and having a good time um, are needs that are being fulfilled through media and it's switched back, right? So in other words, um, a lot of companies and producers were modifying the way that they were presenting their films and material in a way that was meeting the needs and concerns that we as consumers had showing that we had power and influence that would dictate um, how something would get released. Uh, to think about a more funny example, um, 
you know, there was that Morbius movie that became like a massive meme. People would write a whole bunch of reviews of it. Um, you know, they'd write five star reviews, calling it Morbin time, like saying very silly things. And uh, Sony actually misunderstood and essentially got pretty badly trolled because they thought, wow, a whole bunch of people are interested in this movie. We're going to re release it back in theaters. Um, at which point it bombed in theaters because nobody actually really wanted to see it again. Um, they were just um, kind of feigning interest in that. So in this way, um, our interest and desire to be read and spread uh, used in a variety of different ways to motivate the behavior of organizations and groups. So for your final part of attendance today, given some of the things that we've discussed, um, I want you to contrast this a little bit with agenda setting theory, right? We've talked about agenda setting theory, uh, spiral of silence theory, and in what ways is Unigy different in some of its assumptions, approaches, and beliefs about us, and particularly about the ways that we utilize Unigy. So I'll give you some time to think about and uh, share uh, some of your thoughts here. Take a couple more minutes, finish your thoughts. As you're wrapping up here again, I think it's useful for us to think as a starting point, what are the assumptions of the theory? What are the beliefs that um, the authors uh, have coming into the theory and what this theory is ultimately presenting to us? Because that's an opportunity for us to support, to push back, and to explore those elements of the theory in greater detail. UNG is a good theory to understand um, in regards to how we're choosing to utilize media, right? It's taking a more limited approach about the media itself. Um, and it does have some critiques here um, about uh, the intentionality of some of our media choices. So this is a good tool in our toolbox for looking at various forms of media. Uh, on Friday, uh, we'll have Javin present on face negotiation theory. 
which will examine culture, cultural difference, and the ways that that is communicated. Please pass forward or email your attendance for the day. Have a great rest of your day and see you Friday.